Uh, welcome back to the video class Computer Vision for Digital Humanists. Today's class is called Machine Learning for Computer Vision, an Introduction to Terms and Concepts. So this lesson is adapted and also heavily extended from the Computer Vision Glossary, also dubbed the Vocabulaire International du Deep Learning by our colleague Angelos Nicolaou, who wanted us uh, to have a steady base of some common terms. So he can just go on with what he's doing and he will be mentioning all of these terms quite a bit. And if you've never heard about machine learning before, this is going to be a little bit hard. So this is what this class is for. It provides an introduction to machine learning in very basic terms and then essentially lots of uh, definitions. It is uh, a glossary after all, but I try to um, yeah, make it clear what you need, all those things for, and maybe then uh, equipped with this knowledge you will be able to better understand the classes to come. As you can see we have 63 slides and many of them have or are definition slides, so uh, this can take a while, so feel free to take breaks if you need to and maybe revisit this class. You can use it uh, as a resource as you want and you will also get the slides. On some slides I might not say too much, but you can just go back to them if you need them. So we're going to begin with what is machine learning and how does it work. Then we're going to look into a few important terms for machine learning specifically. And then we'll quickly move on to neural networks and deep learning, which is more relevant for what we're doing here. And um, we will look briefly into data and uh, data preprocessing, and uh, then computer vision and then evaluating model performance. So, what is machine learning and how does it work? Mm, so, first we need to understand how algorithms learn, because we talk about machine learning, but obviously machines don't actually learn as we humans do. Uh, machine learning problems evol involve learning from experience with respect to a task, and success is measured by the performance on that task. Machine learning algorithms learn by fitting a function to given data, the resulting function is then called a model, and models are used to make predictions on data. First the training data, then the evaluation or test set. If you are familiar with the general modeling theory, such as by Herbert Stachowiak, uh, these models in machine learning are a bit different from other types of models. They are still scientific models, but obviously they are very mathematical, and they encode in mathematical ways um, very high level concepts, so we have to be a bit careful with how we use them. But that's what uh, we want to achieve with this class. The more you know about how they work, the better you can understand what's going on. So, training data selection is crucial for machine learning success because obviously uh, these machines learn from data. Actually, currently there is this approach uh, that is data-centric AI where people focus more and more on well curating the data sets, which is a very labor-intensive task, uh, rather than uh, fine-tuning models, because models um, change very fast. Recently there has been a huge development in machine learning models and algorithms, so lots of people want to focus a lot on the data and that makes a lot of sense, because having a well-working, well-done data can be an asset for years to come. Uh, accuracy measures how well the model performs on unseen test data and uh, overfitting can occur when the model memorizes the training data. So it basically learns data by heart, but that's not what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to generalize from training data. So ideally it is not perfect on its training data, but it transfers its knowledge very well, whereas a model that is basically perfect, most of the time will have learned by heart the training set and will not generalize that well on other um, data sets, which we can, we can see by uh, dropping performance rates. Mm, proper sampling techniques are important for training and testing, so we don't um, learn implicit sequences. Also, that the machine uh, learns something different than we were actually expecting it to learn. In fact, there are some cases where some machine learning algorithms worked really well and nobody understood why and then years later it came out that it had learned something completely different than what people were thinking it had learned, for example. Mm. So machine learning algorithms require parameter tuning and experience to optimize their behavior. That's a very basic intro to what machine learning is. In this presentation I'm going to repeat some things uh, many times. It's a little bit redundant in that way, 
but I hope that for all of those of you who have never heard about these concepts before, it will be beneficial to hear it multiple times and to also state it in different ways, which is why I want to present some formal definitions of machine learning. An early one by Arthur Samuel in 1959 is, machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly taught. And in fact, there are many, many more of those that also define artificial intelligence a little bit differently. And also in later slide, I'm going to uh, distinguish for you what AI means and what machine learning means because they're often conflated, but they don't mean the exact same thing. Mm. Another definition that is the one um, I'm mostly referring to, to is Tom Mitchell in 1998, who defines machine learning by saying that a well-posed learning problem is defined as follows. A computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some task T and the performance measure P. If its performance on T, as measured by P, improves with experience E, then it is learning. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, but it actually makes a lot of sense. That's why we're going to look at two uh, common examples. And the first one is chess playing. The task T would be playing checkers. Experience E is having the program play tens of thousands of games itself. And the performance measure P is the probability that the program wins the next game of checkers against some new opponent. Obviously, this is a very reduced, very outcome-focused way of learning. We don't necessarily know what it learned along the way and how it re achieved that result. But this is also part of the machine learning process that um, it can help us solve problems where we don't know how to solve them. And sometimes the algorithm will just come up with some optimization that will solve a problem much better than we knew how to do. And another example, very common, is email learns from spam filtering. So based on which emails you mark as spam, your email program will learn better how to filter spam. So the task T would be classifying emails as spam. For example, I think in Gmail you can also see many different types of email like uh, spam or um, advertisements that are personally directed to you, um, social networks and so on. Um, yeah, so experience E would be watching you label emails as spam or not spam. And the performance measure P is the fraction of emails correctly classified. So um, a feedback loop for that could be, for example, if it marks something as spam and you say this is not spam, or it did miss something, if it didn't mark something as spam that was spam, and you say, hey, this is spam, put it in the junk folder, please. And the performance measure P will improve after the experience E if the algorithm is learning. So how does this work in practice? You begin with training. So normally when you're programming, you start uh, with a function that accepts data as input and then provides a result. So the unknown thing is the result, the known things are the function and the data. In machine learning, this is basically turned around. You start with the inputs and you have an idea of the desired outputs. In supervised learning, or you don't even have an idea about them, that would be called unsupervised learning. Now this algorithm uses the information uh, of the input and the desired output to create the desired function that will es essentially associate the input data points with the desired output data points. So, or it comes up with features that might be relevant if you didn't provide uh, such a function. Mm. In model training, the learner algorithm thus maps a function to your data. So you can imagine that you plot your data on a coordinate system and then you want to know, is there a function that describes this data distribution? And once you have that function, you can look up uh, what values this function takes at points that you didn't have values for. This is essentially what is happening. Mm. And that way you can um, uh, input new values into the function, which were not part of the training set, and then see which, which values they take. It's a little bit more complicated in the computer vision tasks, but I think for understanding how machine learning works, this is a pretty good example. Then we have generalization. I already mentioned this term before. Uh, we want to generalize the output function to work on other data than the training set. So if the function maps the input perfectly, then it would uh, what we call overfit. It would fit so perfectly that it can't model anything else anymore. But we want it to generalize so if the algorithm still has some room for improvement by learning, um, it is underfitting. We want the perfect balance of those two. 
Mm. So we would begin with representation. That is when an algorithm creates a model, so a function producing a given result for specific inputs. An important aspect is the discovery of features, so relevant data elements in the source data. If an algorithm is unable to achieve this representation, the data is outside the algorithm's hypothesis space. Then there's the next stage, that's evaluation. The algorithm itself can create many models, but it can't distinguish which one is good. So you need an evaluation function, or you basically need to tell it uh, where it did bad and how it can improve. Mm, and then there's optimization. After comparing more or less successful models, the best one outputted is the result of the training process. So mm, to just say this again in other words, Machine learning algorithms learn by fitting a mathematical function to provided data. In supervised learning, the algorithm is trained on labeled examples to predict target values for new unseen data. This process involves finding the best function, so uh, fitting a function to given data t that explains the given data and generalizes well to make accurate predictions. Minimizing error or cost functions is crucial for directing these algorithms. We will hear much more about those because they are quite central. Mm, the resulting function of this whole process is called a model, and its performance is evaluated using test data. It's important that the algorithm has not seen the test data before, so you need to be very careful not to accidentally create a loop where the model has already seen some of the data. Mm, the trained model can then be used to make predictions on new test data. And maybe a um, funny side note, like the answer to from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, machine learning results are only meaningful when you know the question and its context. So in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, there's this um, attempt to measure the answer to everything and they find out that the answer is 42. And then they realize, oh, we now have to find out what the question actually was. And that is kind of uh, something to keep in mind. So machine learning, we can define it as learning from experience E with respect to task T and measuring performance P, of course, in a computer context. This would be also learning in, in other ways. So we are already through with the first uh, little section. If m this whole machine learning thing was completely new to you, you might want to uh, take a break now, hit pause and return later. Mm. So now let's get on with the important terms. Mm, I want to um, differentiate between artificial intelligence and machine learning because these two terms are being um, thrown around a lot and yeah, sometimes people don't know exactly what it means and it is confusing as well. So artificial intelligence, AI or in German Künstliche Intelligenz KI, refers to the broad field of computer science that aims to develop intelligent machines capable of performing tasks that typically require human intelligence. This encompasses various subfields such as natural language processing, that is machine-powered uh, language processing, computer vision, uh, robotics and machine learning. As you can see, machine learning is a part of that bigger field of AI. AI emerged as a discipline in the 1950s with the goal of building machines capable of human-like intelligence. And uh, before machine learning, there were many different attempts. So for example, teaching uh, system rules uh, that would be called an expert system, so that it can perform tasks of an expert. This was obviously much more limited than what we now understand um, under uh, the label machine learning, but that was also part of AI. Early approaches uh, relied on these uh, rule-based systems were explicit instructions and logical reasoning were used to solve problems. And these um, approaches were quite limited in handling complex real-world scenarios. So this is also why it's an expert system and a domain-specific system, because for an area of expertise it is possible to maybe state all the rules that are relevant and then at some point say, okay, we cut off here. Uh, for example, in language processing, um, they also thought that they would be able to write down all the rules for language and then it became clear that learning language with statistics is uh, a much more viable approach because human language is so irregular, it has so many exceptions that... Um, the other approach doesn't really work. 
So machine learning is a subset of AI that focuses on the development of algorithms and models that enable computers to learn from and make predictions or decisions based on data without being explicitly programmed for each task. This is a game changer. If you remember from the last slide, expert system needed to be explicitly taught everything and explicitly told what to do for every step. This is great obviously because it gives you lots of control, but it's also lots of work and the human beings in the loop are a bottleneck, whereas an algorithm that can uh, do things without being explicitly programmed that will just save you lots of time and having to catch lots of exceptions essentially. Mm. So machine learning algorithms can automatically identify patterns, extract features and improve their performance through experience. This uh, sounds a bit like magic and I hope after this presentation it maybe doesn't sound as much as magic anymore. Um, yeah. So in the 1990s, machine learning gained uh, prominence as a powerful approach to AI. It shifted the focus from explicitly programming machines to allowing them to learn from data. Machine learning algorithms leveraged, stat leveraged statistical models and mathematical models to recognize patterns and make predictions. And this shift led to significant advancements uh, already back then, but even more so in the last few years. So to sum it up, um, or to state it in more technical terms, maybe uh, machine learning is an AI paradigm built around back error propagation algorithms for training statistical models. You will hear a bit more about back error propagation um, from Angelos Nikolaou in the um, taxonomy of methods session. Uh, it involves fitting a function to data for predictions, we've heard that before. And machine learning and specifically deep learning methods offer a powerful tool for solving complex computer vision tasks, which is why we use it here. So um, again, as a summary, AI is the broader field encompassing the quest for human-like intelligence in machines and maybe also the sci-fi fear for um, superhuman intelligence in machines. Um, while uh, machine learning is a specific approach within AI that focuses on learning from data. Machine learning's rise in popularity has influenced the evolution of AI, moving away from rule-based systems toward data-driven learning algorithms. And so there are three different types of machine learning. I've already mentioned two of them before, supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement learning. Now what are they and how do they differ? And they do differ in significant ways. Supervised learning means training a statistical model using input, observed output and the desired output. These uh, so-called correct answers, the ground truth, are given and we supervise if the algorithm is able to reproduce them. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, it means training a statistical model without knowing the desired output. It uh, can help finding patterns and structures in uh, unlabeled data. There are no right or wrong answers. Uh, we're just wondering, can structures, clusters or patterns be detected by an algorithm? Uh, examples are clustering, self-supervision and metric learning. Mm, reinforcement learning is training a statistical model to achieve a long-term goal and it's learning by trial and error with feedback. It's a form of semi-supervised learning or maybe weekly supervised learning. Um, for example, uh, a robot. If a robot uh, is asked to walk then it has a long-term goal, it uh, has to walk, and if it falls on its face, for example, that is negative feedback, much like uh, for human beings when we learn, and so it will try to correct if it uh, has bad experiences. And then there are many more important terms, in fact, and one of them is a regression problem. We distinguish between regression and classification, and regression predicts continuous uh, output um, as opposed to discrete valued output. So for example, price, they're like continuous numbers. Like in linear regression, for example, mm, I think in a uh, famous machine learning uh, course era class, they have the example of predicting uh, how house prices or apartment prices increase with the size of the apartment. That would be a linear regression. Usually they become more expensive with um, increasing size of the apartment. In computer vision, regression can be used to predict numerical attributes such as object position, size and orientation in an image. Mm, a classification problem, on the other hand, we will see one in the practical, predicts discrete valued output. So values like 0 or 1, that would be binary classification, 
all multiple classes of outcomes or probabilities. Uh, we expect discrete value and output, so the result is either 1 or 0, and obviously if it's multi-class it's a little bit different, but that is the general idea. Mm. So, as I already mentioned, there's binary versus multi-class classification. Classification is the supervised learning task that involves assigning labels or categories to input data based on their characteristics. In binary classification, the task is to distinguish between two classes or categories, while in multi-class classification, as the name says, the goal is to assign inputs to more than two classes. In computer vision, classification is commonly used for tasks such as object recognition or image categorization. Then I've also already mentioned the term ground truth. Uh, this is the correct and expected output for a given input to a model. We will learn how to generate an, a ground truth data set in a practical exercise later. And ground truthing would be manually annotating data in order to create ground truth. Then there's the loss function or cost or error function. I've already mentioned this before and even though it sounds very boring and mathematical, I think this is really the key concept that helped me understand uh, how machine learning works. So maybe give this a bit of thought. The loss function is a measure of how bad um, a given prediction is, so that means how far from the correct values. Mm. You could also mathematically define it as a differentiable function applied to the output of a model demonstrating how the output for a specific input could have been better, and it's used to optimize models. Typical examples include cross entropy or the mean square error of focal and so on. So just to give a very quick example of the mean square error. So you would calculate mm, what the expected value would be and what the actual value would be that the model outputted. And there's a difference between the two. And so we calculate that difference and then we square it. So if the difference was very big, squaring it makes it um, much, much bigger. If the difference was very small, not much difference happens. That means if it was only a little bit off, we don't punish the system too much. But if it was way off, then these errors get punished a lot and the system will uh, adjust how it works to try and um, improve these errors. This is also uh, complicated technically how that works. In neural networks, that would be the backpropagation algorithm that I mentioned, because you know, first we run the function, we get an output, we calculate the error, and then how do we communicate back, for example, to the initial neurons that um, they need to change. This is where the back error propagation algorithms comes in that we don't need to understand in detail, but um, you need to, I think, understand the role it plays in the learning. So this is how a model knows it's off and it has to change some things. Then there's the term gradient descent. This is also a very technical term related to these error cost functions and it's an algorithm uh, meant to minimize this function. So we will look at the der derivative, that is uh, a, like a slope at a given point, of the loss curve and then take steps downwards the curve to uh, essentially minimize the error. So we want to find a global minimum for the error, mathematically speaking. And the size of those steps that we're using to reach that minimum is the learning rate. So now you could wonder why don't we just jump to the correct point. Uh, that can be a problem because um, sometimes we don't know where the slope is going or we can't see what the um, correct direction is initially. We can't see the minimum. Well, we will find it when, for example, if you walk down a hill and at some point you realize no matter what direction you turn, there is no way to go lower, then that would be how you find these minima. However, as you can see with the hill analogy, you might be missing, uh, you might be at a local minimum and then miss the global minimum. So you might be at a point where you can't see that there is any place, like for example in a valley, you can't see that there is any place that's lower than where you're currently standing, but there might well be. Mm. So this is one, uh, one problem with gradient descent. Uh, you could also say, you can imagine gradient descent, I think I would always imagine, imagine it like, uh, like a multi-dimensional plane or like walking down a hill, but with fog, for example. And so this is the optimizer algorithm for a neural network uh, that usually 
or the optimizer algorithm for a neural network usually uses some kind of this. Mm. And then there's actually stochastic gradient descent that I have in another slide. I think it's somewhere else, maybe. The difference with this one would be that you could imagine it like walking down the hill slightly drunk. So you would jump between points and this helps avoid uh, a landing in a local minimum. So now there's this term back error propagation that I mentioned before. If you really want to understand this, take some time. It's really complicated, but I'm not sure if you really have to. Mm. This means that the chain rule of differentiation is applied to errors computed on the output. So this applies to neural networks. We will learn about the specifics of neural networks uh, just in a few moments. Mm. But essentially in neural networks you have multiple stages through which uh, a result is propagated and then you are at the end. That's where you calculate the cost or error and then you have to propagate it back to the beginning weights or parameters to um, change how the model is working. Mm. So the goal is to define the error gradient, the slope, with respect to the model parameters and gradient descent is a technique to change these parameters in order to reduce the error. Uh, then another term is inference and this is the final step in, machine, in the machine learning pipeline where the trained model is used to make predictions on new unseen data. I've already mentioned the term overfitting multiple times before and that occurs when the machine learning model performs well on the training data but fails to generalize to unseen data. This can happen if the model becomes too complex and starts memorizing the training examples instead of learning the underlying patterns. Because as I've mentioned before it's sometimes difficult to tell what exactly it is learning and we want to make sure it's learning general things that can generalize to something else and not just learning things by heart. Regularization techniques and proper validation strategies are used to mitigate this overfitting. And then there's another term that's a support vector machines, which is a popular supervised learning algorithm used for classification and regression tasks. But I guess, uh, yeah, maybe it was popular. It's uh, a little bit dated now, I guess. Mm. The support vector machine finds a hyperplane that separates different classes by maximizing the margin between them. They're effective in handling high dimensional data and can handle both linear and non-linear decision boundaries. And usually shallow classifiers, um, uh, there are shallow classifiers that are usually employed on top of handcrafted features. Handcrafted features mean there's, uh, means there a lot, that lots of work goes into this, which is what usually we want to avoid, but maybe in the humanities can make sense because we want lots of control. Metric space. Uh, that means all possible vectors of a given size equipped with a distance function between any two members of the space. You don't need to understand all those terms in detail, just if you come across them, maybe you can go back to this and look it up. Clustering is an unsupervised learning technique used to group similar data points together based on their intrinsic properties. The goal of clustering is to discover hidden patterns of structures in, or structures in the data. Then we have a baseline that, for example, Angelos is going to talk about in the epistemology and uh, performance evaluation session. The baseline is a method used as a point of reference expected to demonstrate improvement. So, for example, how well does a model from five years ago perform? And then we use that as a baseline to show that we perform well. Or, for example, how well does a blind guess that doesn't take the input data into account, how well does that perform? And then um, that's what we use to measure if our model learned anything and if it's any good. And the state of the art, you probably know this from other fields, it, this is the consensus about which method is best to solve a given problem at a certain time in these uh, machine learning contexts. Yeah, so we are already through with the second session and can move on to neural networks. Uh, first of all, I want to recommend uh, this YouTube channel, it's called 3 Blue One Brown and uh, on this channel you can find really good um, visualizations of all these machine learning things. For example, how gradient descent works and how neural networks learn. I can highly recommend this and I think um, this channel explains it so much better than I can with the visualizations. So 
if you're confused after this, maybe you want to look into these, this playlist. So, neural networks. Um, their statistical models processing information in structured layers um, and process the information in parallel through elementary operation. So you have many, many neurons that all contribute a tiny little bit to the whole algorithm and they um, basically the compounded effect of very many of those neurons is what gets you the result. And a deep neural network is a neural network with more than two layers, usually tens, uh, hundreds or thousands. But if they're very long, they can lead to vanishing or exploding gradients, which I will also define and which Angelos will talk about in the taxonomy session. Weights. I've also already mentioned this before. Uh, parameters or weights in machine learning refer to learnable coefficients that are adjusted during the training process. These coefficients control the behavior of the model and are updated to minimize the loss function during training. So they're all the variables required for inference and to compute it during training. A convolutional neural network, CNN, is a type of neural, deep neural network particularly suited for computer vision tasks and it can take an input image, assign importance, so learnable weights and biases, to various objects in the image and be able to differentiate one from another. These CNNs leverage the spatial structure of images through convolutional layers, which apply filters to capture local patterns and hierarchically learn features at different scales. They've been highly successful at tasks such as image classification, object detection and semantic segmentation. You'll hear about those computer vision tasks a little bit later. So um, we can maybe summarize a neural network processing information that is structured in pixel format with some convolutional layers and when it's fully convolutional, that means only convolutional layers and the information is always in pixel structure. So how this works is an image is propagated through a sequence of convolutional layers. So uh, pixel structure layers and uh, the deep layers have more channels that necessitate a reduction in resolution via pooling. And the end uh, representation is essentially a vector with one pixel spanning many channels. Oops. Mm. So these uh, convolutional neural networks for image classification are made, made up of two parts. That is the convolutional base, a series of pooling and convolution layers that extract general features that the model can find in the images. You will see examples of that in Angelos' lecture and I hope having heard this uh, definition before will maybe help you uh, understand it better. Mm. And then there's a densely connected classifier. So the final dense layers and the output layer, uh, which look for specific features for the task, so only whether they're present, not where they are in the picture. And the earlier layers in the CNN detect basic features like angles and lines, while the later layers detect complex features such as eyes, faces, flowers, wheels and so on. The same base can be used for other problems, in which case the base layers are frozen, so not trained any further, and you only um, train the rest of the model. Transfer learning is useful when a dataset is too small to train a model from scratch. So you can use the base representations gained from other training for your model and then only adapt the final layers. So uh, using knowledge gained from solving one problem to solve a similar problem is called transfer learning. So for example, using a model that was trained to recognize cars to recognize trucks. And this can work um, by only replacing the classification layer Mm, and sometimes uh, fine-tuning. So fine-tuning is closely related to this uh, and unlike transfer learning, fine-tuning can involve retaining parts of the convolutional base, uh, usually the last few layers, and how many layers of the model are retained depends on how similar two problems are. Mm, convolutional neural networks are basically essential in uh, the computer vision world and there was uh, quite an evolution with Lenet uh, 5 in 1998, AlexNet in 2012, that was uh, basically sensational and revolutionized the field, and it became the ImageNet state of the art. Then uh, VGG in 2014, GoogleNet and or Inception in 2014, and ResNet. I'm not going to go into more detail here. If you want to know more, we have the history session that talks about the history of computer vision research, and then also the convolutional neural networks are so essential that they come up in the epistemology and the taxonomy sessions as well.
then just a few more terms. Residual networks are CNNs um, that add the output of layers to the input, facilitating back error propagation. Recurrent neural networks or RNNs are uh, neural networks organized in cells where the output of a cell is applied on a part of a signal is fed into a cell along with the next part of the signal. Uh, and some examples are LSTM and DRU and uh, Angulus will also talk about LSTM for a while. And training algorithms are back propagation through time. A generative adversarial network or a GAN is uh, something that you've probably heard before uh, it's a network that learned to generate images by trying to fool another network. I'll have another slide on that in the image generation uh, slides. And then an autoencoder is a network with an hourglass architecture that usually learns to compress samples. You will learn more about that in Angulos' session as well. Deep learning framework, one term that isn't so hard. Uh, that's basically just a programming library allowing the description of a network architecture so we get this error back propagation automatically. Uh, some examples are PyTorch, TensorFlow, Google Jax, Theano and Cafe. TensorBoard is something that uh, Angelos will be using in his practical session. Uh, that's a web-based visualization tool provided by TensorFlow and it helps in visualizing and monitoring the training process of deep learning models. It displays various metrics such as loss and accuracy and visualizes the model architecture and intermediate activations. Optimization, we've also already heard that before, is finding the optimal parameters of a model in order to minimize a mathematically defined function of it. Linear is easier than convex, which is easier than continuous. Model training is the optimization of those weights, parameters of a neural network in order to minimize the error over the training set. This is essentially a an alternative definition for the machine learning definitions that I gave earlier. Um, gradient descent, I've also already mentioned, is the optimization algorithm that jumps on the direction of the lowest error at every step, like walking down a mountain with fog. And then there's stochastic gradient descent, so um, like with a randomness factor. Uh, is gradient descent based on a subset of the train set resampled randomly at every iteration that is like kind of walking down the hill drunk, but prevents you from landing in a local minimum. Regularization, it means uh, making a representation more simple but less exact. Um, and then there's vanishing and exploding gradients, which Angelos will also talk about. Uh, in deep networks, the error gradient can converge to zero, that is a vanishing gradient, or diverge to infinity, exploding. So these are some very mathematical bases, and I guess if you want to understand in lots of depth how machine learning works, you need to look at math, and there are many books about math for machine learning, but I guess for us, maybe not that relevant, but just so you've heard about it before. And then there's also these activation functions. They uh, refer to the output of a neuron or layer in a neural network. They introduce non-linearity into the model, allowing it to learn complex relationships between inputs and outputs, some examples are ReLU, Sigmoid, or a SoftMax. ReLU stands for a Rectified Linear Unit. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail. You can uh, look up these definitions as they're on the slides, which will be provided for you. But maybe you will see this in the code somewhere and then be confused. So now you can know where to go back and look for this thing. ADAM is also another optimization algorithm uh, that stands for Adaptive Moment Estimation and it combines the benefits of some other algorithms and you can always look up what the state of the art, what the suggested best solution for your problem might be at the current time. Sigmoid, for example, is an activation function that squashes the input into a range between 0 and 1, which is commonly used in binary classification problems where the output represents the probability of a certain class. And softmax um, is for multi-class classification problems. So, we're already done with the worst uh, part, I guess. Uh, there's some more uh, info on image and data preprocessing, which you will need for the practical uh, to get the data, and uh, then some more computer vision tasks. Just a few um, very general terms on pattern recognition, information theory, and signal processing. Just so you've heard about them before, pattern recognition is the field of 
study applying machine learning on data of specific uh, domains. Information theory was invented by Claude Shannon in the 40s. It's for quantifying information through statistics, which is very important in computer science. And signal processing is a field of electrical engineering that applies information theory to natural world measurements, such as sound uh, or text, images or videos. Then there's the image, pixel, channel, uh, convolution and frequency domain, just a few more definitions. Um, you probably know what a pixel is, um, but just uh, to be sure. So it's one or more numerical values representing measured light at one or more wave bands. It can hold more abstract information organized in the grid and deep learning. And a channel is part of a pixel representing a specific number for that pixel, for example green from an RGB image. Convolution is a local weight sum operator over a signal with specific weights, which can be 1, 2 or 3D. And the frequency domain is a representation where each number of a signal represents how much of a frequency contributes to the total energy. Not sure if you're actually going to need these terms, but Angelos wanted them explained, so they might come up in his lectures. So some more practical things for the first practical get the data. Uh, Pre-processing steps for image data. Susanna Sagadin is going to talk about that. I just wanted to have them on the slides so you've maybe heard about them before and maybe you can assimilate the knowledge in your brain a little bit better. So in building a deep learning pipeline, one of the initial steps is pre-processing, also known as the transformation process. This stage prepares raw data to be in the right format and structure for a deep learning model because there's just certain uh, requirements and uh, technical implementation specifics that you just need to follow if you want to use these frameworks. So you convert the image to RGB, that is not always necessary, maybe resize the image to um, a certain pixel size, convert it to a tensor and normalize the image. So converting to RGB can be necessary if some of your images are grayscale and some are not. Then you need to provide them all in the same format and that means you will just um, like a um, like a data type conversion, basically, you will provide it in the correct data format. And uh, RGB stands for red, green, and blue. It's a color color model commonly used for displaying images on electric systems. RGB images are represented by three color channels, each specifying the intensity of the respective color component. Mm, then the resizing the image. Um, so all the images that we feed into our deep learning model need to be the same size. This is because the model's input layer expects a fixed size input. If the images have varying dimensions, the model can't learn effectively. So by resizing them all to the same size, we ensure that they have the same dimension and the choice of 20, 224 uh, by 224 is standard in many pre-trained networks, uh, such as those in the ImageNet database. I guess um, Angelos in the practical on the large model will maybe talk about options here because how you pre-process the data might have uh, consequences for how well the model learns. Mm. Then you need to convert the image to a tensor. So in the context of deep learning, a tensor is a multi-dimensional array that is a generalization of vectors and matrices to potentially higher dimensions. It's the primary data structure neural networks use. That's why you just need to get familiar with it. Mm. Then you need to normalize the image. That is the process of standardizing pixel values. Uh, the purpose is uh, to uh, change the range of intensity values. And by normalizing, we make sure that the inputs have a similar data distribution as to not cause errors with outliers, for example. This makes it easier for the model to learn and to make predictions based on the standardized input. Normalized data helps uh, gradient descent converge more quickly, which leads to faster training, which is also important because big models can take a while. Um, yeah, so normalizing means usually transforming in uh, such values that the mean and standard deviation of the image become 0 or 1 respectively. It gets the data with, within the range and reduces the skewedness, which helps uh, them learn faster and better, and it can help tackle these problems that I mentioned before, like diminishing and exploding gradients. And then uh, last note on the input shape. So you might get errors that say inputs must have the same shape errors. Mm. 
so when we refer to shape we speak of dimensions mm, so if they are not all of the same shape you will get errors which is why we had to convert them then there's also data whitening that is uh, statistically pre-processing input samples so that they share the same properties which is not as important with pre-trained models but methods can be principal component analysis or zero phase component analysis mm, so Again, why do we need images of the same size and channels? Because they cannot be combined in a batch. And a batch for PyTorch um, will be transformed into a single tensor without, with one extra dimension. So you provide a list of images, uh, each of a certain size. PyTorch will stack them so your model has a single tensor input of that shape. And the stacking can only happen when the images are of the same shape. This is based in maths. So it's the maths of uh, how to handle uh, matrices. So this is the just the pure mathematical reason for why we have to do this. Mm. A mini batch is a random subsample of the trained dataset stacked as a 4D tensor that propagates through the network in one step. Vector space is the location of a point expressed in a multiple um, multi-dimensional space. And the matrix is the M by N 2D grid of numbers where rows and columns can be perceived as vectors. And a tensor is a generalization of the concept of vectors to more than two dimensions. So finally, the mathematical and technical terms are over and we are on to uh, computer vision terms. This is actually not going to be that long because the whole school is about computer vision and you will hear about these things many more times. Some key terms, an image, um, probably know what that is, a 2D representation of a visual scene. Pixel is the smallest addressable element in a digital pixel image. Uh, convolution, we've already said that. Um, optimization, algebra is the branch of maths concerned with us and these image operations. Vector, we've heard before, matrix, tensor and the distance. Uh, these are all operations that are fundamentals for computer vision essentially. Mm. Then um, another term that you might come across are morphological operators. They will be addressed in uh, our um, contributor Germain Götzelmann's tools session. They are tools for processing um, binary images that were very popular in the 80s and 90s but they still have some applications for example in the digital humanities. They can be used for example for page segmentation. Image segmentation is the process of dividing an image into multiple segments, often to simplify and or change the representation of an image into something that is more meaningful and easier to analyze. In essence, it's the process of classifying all pixels of an image. And image classification is a fundamental task in computer vision with notable datasets, um, including MNIST and ImageNet. Uh, the ImageNet Challenge is a popular competition in the field. We'll say some more about these uh, important datasets later. Mm. And key computer vision tasks or parts of computer vision tasks are a classification, so assigning a label to an input data point, regression, predicting continuous valued output, we've already heard that before, object detection, um, identifying objects within an image and their location, Segmentation, uh, dividing an image into multiple segments or regions. Image retrieval uh, is searching and retrieving images from a database that match a query. Texture is uh, analysis and class classification of the surface quality of an object. This can, for example, be also used for segmenting things because it helps you detect the borders. Mm, and OCR or HDR, so opt optical and hand Optical character recognition and handwritten text recognition are tasks for recognizing printed or written text characters that you've probably already come across. Mm. Then the topic that um, is uh, highly discussed at the moment, which is image generation. Uh, for that we need to know some terms for the generative adversarial networks. And the first one is adversarial samples. So these are images that fool neural networks. Angelos is going to talk about this in his um, taxonomy session. Mm, and these are computed with a trained network to find the minimum changes needed to deceive another network. Style transfer makes um, deep layers resemble a content image and early 
layers resemble a style image, that's how uh, style transfer works, and it does not even require network training and can be applied at different scales. Generative adversarial networks, as mentioned before, abbreviated as GANs, uh, comprise two networks where one mimics the real data and the other tries to tell them apart. This can create things that never existed, but these are challenging to train. And maybe a more formal definition is um, generative adversarial networks are a class of deep learning models that consist of two neural networks, a generator and a discriminator. The network generates synthetic data samples, such as images, while the discriminator learns to distinguish between real and generated data. They're widely used for tasks such as image synth synthesis, image translation, and data augmentation in computer vision. Then in data pre-processing, we have a few key techniques this color space manipulation, uh, which means converting images from one color space to another. Data whitening, that is a pre-processing technique used to transform the data in a way that is covariance matrix is the identity matrix. Data augmentation is pretty important. Uh, there are techniques used to increase the amount of data by adding slightly modified copies of already existing data. This can help if you have a small data set. And data synthesis means creating new samples. And then there are a few training techniques, one of which we've already heard about, which is regularization, uh, used to prevent overfitting by adding an additional penalty to the loss function. Uh, then what we haven't heard before is dropout. That is a regularization method that involves temporarily dropping out neurons in the network. Drop connect is a generalization of dropout where individual weights in the network are dropped out. And knowledge transfer is using knowledge learned from one task to solve a similar one. Knowledge distillation is a technique of compressing a large model called the teacher into a small model called the student. And then some more terms that might come up is multimodality. That means to the integration of multiple sources of information or modalities. For example, this can uh, mean combining visual data with data such as text. For example, if you generate images from text, that would be multimodal. Or you want to caption images with text, that would also be multimodal. And a term that comes up in that context is BERT, the bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, which is a pre-trained language model introduced by Google. This has revolutionized natural language processing tasks by learning contextualized representations of words. And it can be used in computer vision uh, in conjunction with visual features to perform tasks that require both visual and uh, textual understanding, such as image captioning and visual question answering. Yeah, so we are in the final stage, and that is evaluating model performance. Just a few more words on that. The real lesson on this is going to be in the Angelos' epistemology and evaluation uh, session. So, first of all, we have to notice that not all mistakes are equal, and depending on our problem, we need different metrics to find them. So if we just look, for example, at the accuracy, that uh, can be misleading, as Angelos will show. The accuracy means how many items are classified correctly. So the number of correct observations divided by the number of total observations. So if uh, 7 out of 10 are correct, it's 70% accurate. The problem is, if the classes are imbalanced, accuracy says little about the quality of the classifier. For example, that uh, Angelos is going to talk about, if a fraction of the quote, the charters are only forgeries, then a blind guess that all are correct will give us a great accuracy, but the model will not have learned anything. We can basically guess that without any further information. So when we have nine, 990 of class A and 10 of class B, the classifier will always say that A is 99% um, accurate. The alternative to this is precision and recall and they are observed individually per class, and you need to always look at multiple of these metrics. Precision is important when we're interested in a specific class, such as forgeries detected, and looking for the maximum amount of true positives in the relevant class. What we actually ask is how many class A predictions are actually class A objects. So three class A uh, items um, divided by five class A predictions is a 60% precision. Optimizing for precision minimizes false positives, so it's good for recommendation algorithms. And recall is important when we don't want to miss any instance of a class. This is the detection rate. 
uh, and it asks how many class A objects out of the total number of class A objects were recognized. So this uh, here it's better if we recognize maybe some that are uh, not actually true, but we have all the true positives. For example, in, I don't know, terror um, uh, detection, terrorist attack detection, we would want to have a high detection rate. Three out of four total class A objects are recognized, then that is a 75% recall. And if we optimize for recall, that minimizes false negatives. For example, also good for medical diagnosis and the F1 score is um, the harmonic average between precision and recall that we might also want to take into account. Because obviously these values don't agree with each other, you can't optimize for all of them. That's why we might want to have an average. Mm. When investigating these things, uh, you will come across the term of a confusion matrix, which is a table that summarizes the performance of a classification model. It shows the number of true positive, true negative, false positive and false negative predictions, allowing for the calculation of various performance metrics, such as the before-mentioned uh, accuracy, um, precision, recall and F1 score. Another term is the mean average precision or MAP, which is a popular evaluation metric uh, in object detection tasks, which measures the average precision of the model across multiple object classes, considering both precision and recall. And then a few more data science terms, or for a lack of a better word, I guess, that you might uh, hear in the context of machine learning, which is a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution, uh, that is a probability distribution, uh, that is symmetric and bell-shaped, it's also called the bell curve, and many real-world phenomena follow this distribution, which is why it's a commonly used assumption in statistical and machine learning models. Then there's UMAP, uh, which uh, Angulus will talk about uh, in his uh, session. Mm, it stands for the Unified Manifold Approximation and Projection, which is a dimensionality reduction technique. And the TSNE stands for T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding is also a dimensionality reduction technique for visualizing high dimensional data and then principal component analysis PCA uh, is a dimensionality reduction technique that transforms high dimensional data into lower dimensional representations while retaining most of the, uh, the most important information. And the nearest neighbor which is a classification algorithm that assigns a test sample to the class of its nearest neighbors in the training data, which um, measures similarity between samples using a distance metric such as Euclidean distance or cosine similarity. So we're at the final point. Mm. I hope you've made it through here and are still a little bit attentive. Mm. The last point is not so difficult, it's just about a few data sets that you might hear about in the context of computer vision. So the ImageNet challenge, as mentioned before, was conducted in 2011 to 2016 um, with uh, lots of classes. It consists of 1.2 million train set images, uh, 50,000 validation and 100,000 um, test set. And this ImageNet dataset is a large scale dataset containing millions of labeled images across thousands of categories commonly used for object recognition and classification tasks. It's very influential. Then there's also MNIST, which is maybe not so influential, but you will hear about it in the history of computer vision, and it's very important as a, uh, I don't know, first attempt data set or um, as a hello world data set. You'll find many tutorials online that use MNIST. It's a widely used benchmark data set of machine learning and consists uh, of a large set of 28 by 28 pixel grayscale images of handwritten digits, 0 to 9, along with their corresponding labels. It's often used for tasks such as digit recognition and classification and used as a hello world for computer vision. And there's also Fashion MNIST, which is considerably more complicated. And MNIST was created by the US Postal System, or for the US Postal System. And it was one of the first things that worked uh, using such an approach. Fashion MNIST is a benchmark data set in machine learning for image classification as well, consisting of 60,000 28 by 28 grayscale images of fashion items such as t-shirts and so on. Each image is labeled with the corresponding class and thus it's suitable for training and evaluating machine learning models for image classification. 
And then there's iris, which is also popular, or there's some tutorials about it, which contains measurements of different attributes of three different species of iris flowers, also used for classification tasks. And uh, yeah, benchmark datasets are standardized and widely used datasets that serve as reference points for evaluating the performance of machine learning models. And in computer vision, several benchmark datasets have been established. Some of them are Caltech 101, Caltech 256, Pascal VOC, visual uh, object classes, ImageNet, as mentioned before, MS Coco, the Microsoft Common Objects in Context, and Google Open Images. These datasets enable you to compare the performance of different computer vision models on standardized tasks, but many of them are also problematic and they have um, inherent bias. Um, Nicolas has talked in his uh, computer vision history session about the 2 million tiny images uh, dataset that had uh, serious problems and was thus retired. Mm, and in the outro session, the state of the art on computer vision use in digital humanities, in the ethics section, there will be a discussion of these um, last benchmark datasets that I mentioned in terms of how they were created and as a data criticism perspective on those datasets and what it implies when we reuse them. Okay, so thanks for your attention. I hope you're ready now for the other presentations and good luck with the course.